It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry Lasseur and Ned Calmer. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Basil O'Connor, president of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. In spite of all the miraculous advances made in medical science during our lifetimes, there's still one epidemic, uncontrollable disease that's increasing every year. And this year, unfortunately, is no exception. Despite all our efforts, polio is affecting more people this summer than ever before. Now, Mr. O'Connor, earlier this year, we were told that uh, we might be on the verge of victory over polio through the new Salk vaccine. What has happened? Well, we still may be on the verge of victory. Uh, of course, this last summer we put on the one great field trial of a vaccine that's ever been had in the history of the world. We gave the uh, vaccine to 445,000 children. We gave another 200,000 uh, what we call a, an innocuous uh, substance, what we call a placebo. And uh, in 217 places throughout the country, we tested out the validity of uh, what we call the salt vaccine. Mean some it's people didn't know they were what they were getting? Uh, that the uh, half the group in the placebo study, the control study, half them uh, uh, got vaccine, half got something else, but nobody knows. We have the key to that. But when will the results be known? Well, that's a, right now, of course, we're going through the evaluation period, and that's a long, hard, uh, a laborious job. And I don't see how we can possibly know that until the epidemic season is over, say around November the 1st, then it'll take time after that, and we can't possibly know the results until, de uh, until December 31st. Maybe not then. We well, just Mr. O'Connor, is it possible that some of these people who are getting uh, polio now are getting it from the vaccine? Uh, that could be possible, but we have no reason to believe it. And any, in any event, in the placebo study, we couldn't tell because until you break the key and find out who got the vaccine, who got the placebo, you don't know. But so far, uh, uh, the safety of this vaccine has been uh, really uh, ruled out. I well, mean, is there any more of it uh, available now, sir? No, you see, this vaccine is simply now in the trial state. It's not commercially available. It can't be bought. No, it can't be bought. And uh, if it's determined to be effective, of course, well, then the manufacturing houses undoubtedly will produce it to the extent they can. Well, has the efficacy of this Jonas Salk vaccine actually been proved? Well, I think in the laboratory, or, or rather experimental-wise, not in the laboratory, it has in the laboratory monkeys, but in human beings, experimental-wise, it has been demonstrated that uh, this vaccine will raise the antibody content of the blood sufficient, uh, which should be sufficient to protect against poly paralytic polio when it's encountered in the natural stage. But until that happens, you see what we've done now, we've given the vaccine, and now we're waiting for the epidemics to come in those 217 areas so that these children will come in contact with the disease in the natural condition. Now, if, they, uh, if the uh, vaccine is effective, it should prevent them from getting paralytic polio. Paralytic polio, that's what we want to find out. Well, you said 217 uh, various areas. Now, where are the are in most cases cropping up now, sir? Most cases now, this year, we are in four spots so far. Rather curiously, uh, California, Texas, Florida, and Hawaii. Believe it or not, Hawaii is having uh, qu quite a quite a relatively large incidence. I think my my memory is right. I hope they're having a they have 137 cases now, as against a five-year average, something like 70 cases. It's a cases. hot weather disease. Well, well we used to think so, but associated we, with the we don't know anymore. It is yes. We get our peaks in July and August and September, but now it. Uh, lots of places in this country, uh, it's endemic. Now, don't ask me which places, because nobody likes to have that set of their place, but, but it runs pretty well through the year. We'll have it from January 1st to November, December 31st. Well, Mr. O'Connor, how do you account for the fact that uh, children get it more often in the summer when we think of them as getting more sun and more exercises and being generally healthier? Well, uh, of course, you know, I'm a layman. I'm not a scientist, so I, all, I, all I can tell you is what somebody else tells me. I think it's probably due primarily to the fact that they make new contacts. They go from a place uh, where they've had no immunity and they go to another place and get into other crowds where the disease is prevalent and they, they, uh, they uh, encounter it that way. They get into new groupings of children. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's probably movement in the summer plus uh, uh, getting overtired, uh, over-exercising, and uh, then neglect not watching their, 
uh, their uh, headaches and their colds and so forth. Well, is it wise, do you think, to keep a child isolated during the summer, or is it uh, better to expose them to these new contexts that they normally would meet at camps and in pools? Well, I certainly, would, uh, certainly wouldn't expose them to the disease itself, but uh, uh, I don't think one can go so far as to keep their child isolated. Uh, and I think uh, we, we really don't know. Uh, we, we do know that it doesn't come from water. We know it doesn't come from pools or milk or things like that. We know it's a contact disease, and therefore, I suppose the more contacts you make and the newer the contacts, uh, the more you increase the likelihood. But uh, uh, Emerson once, you know, wrote an, Emerson, uh, an essay saying that uh, you can't run away from anything. So that, uh, but I think it is a good idea to see that they don't get tired, uh, too tired. Uh, call the doctor the minute they show any symptoms. Well, supposing uh, one's child develops a, a sore throat during the summer, what should the parent do about it? Call should the doctor. immediately go and ask for a, a shot of a uh, soft vaccine? No, they won't get it because it's not available. But the thing they should do is call the doctor. And then uh, first make sure it is uh, polio and not get too excited about it. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. And if there's a large family, Mr. O'Connor, uh, uh, will the others um, uh, immediately be exposed? I don't if think one there's any doubt about that. If you have one case in the family, the others in the family will all have had that virus. Now, they may not have paralytic polio, but they will have had the virus. Well, Mr. O'Connor, should you immediately take the child and send it away, or send the other children away to their grandmothers or to friends to get them away from the child which has polio or I, the I adult? Sh I shouldn't think so. I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but I shouldn't think so. I th think it would all depend on what uh, the family doctor feels is their condition. How serious he thinks whether they're going to be paralytic polio, if they're going to be paralytic polio, the hospital is undoubtedly the best place for them in some cases, not all cases. If, if they look like they're going to be an abortive case, why they're just as well at home as they are anywhere else, provided they're put to bed and get over the early symptoms. Well, Mr. O'Connor, you're talking about the uh, soft vaccine this summer. And last year, there was a tremendous run on what was called the gamma globulin. That's right. Now, the United States Public Health Service, I understand, doesn't feel that gamma globulin is effective anymore. No, no, no. They never said, the public health never said that. No. Uh, what happened was a committee uh, uh, that was uh, set up by the Public Health Service uh, made a report out of Atlanta that said uh, the use of gamma globulin in family context was no good. And we always said that. There never was any basis for believing it was any good. And then they said that the use of gamma globulin in mass prophylaxis, giving it to in the mass, all they said was that as it was used last summer, they couldn't draw a conclusion whether it was good or not. But the fact remains that the, the only scientific con uh, test, the control test made by Dr. Hammond in 51 and 52, which we paid for in the National Foundation, that scientific test still proves that gamma globulin, given at the proper time before the virus gets into the host, uh, and the proper kind of gamma globulin will protect uh, from uh, originally uh, for five weeks, but his recent uh, uh, work in the laboratory shows that it'll protect for eight weeks. So the only scientific evidence that exists shows that gamma globulin is as effective as it ever was and will protect temporarily against paralytic polio. Now it is available, the public health men have it, there will be a demand for it this summer, and, and it should and it will be used. But uh, all that report said was that used in the contact method, you remember I've just said that once you have a case in the family, they've all got the virus. Well, obviously, giving them gamma globulin then won't help them any, and, and that was well known, and why it was ever used that way, we never could well, understand. Well, do I understand, sir, that you cannot get a uh, inoculation or a vaccination from the SALK vaccine now, but you still can get an inoculation of gamma globulin? That's right. There's about two million shots of gamma globulin available in this country. And uh, that's been distributed among the public health men, not all of it, but it's available. It's half of it's uh, gone out or is available. The other half will be available when the public health men want it. And they can use it much more liberally this year. That is, they don't have to do just great masses. They can use it in groups above the family group. For instance, if they have a school where there's a couple of cases and they want to, they can give it to the rest of the children in that school. That they couldn't do last summer. So it can be used much better, much more quickly this summer, uh, and uh, they have it, and to the extent they have it, to be sure, still in limited supply, uh, there will be a demand for it, and it should be used. They've used a lot of it in Florida. And I think the reports out of Florida are going to be very encouraging as to the use of gamma globulin when it is used in the proper time and in the proper way. Tell us, Mr. O'Connor, how, how did you get into this work in the first place, and I when was through, that? I uh, got President Roosevelt. We were law partners, and we went down to Warm Springs in 1924. That's the first time he went down When there. he got polio, you mean, he got when polio, he contracted no, he got, it? He got polio in 21. Yes. And then uh, he got interested in Warm Springs. They had a pool there with hot water. Uh, and uh, he went down to look the place over, and I went down with him. And then uh, he started to take it over and make uh, 
uh, is a place available to other people. Then he was elected governor in 1928, and he simply said to me, well, you take over, and I took over. And you took well, over. Mr. Mr. O'Connor, it seems that the National Foundation is going to run another drive for funds, but I remember back in January you raised $55 million, which was the greatest sum ever raised in the history of the Foundation. That's right. Now, why do you need more money? Well, you see, in January we asked for $75 million for our big four programs. Now, one of our big programs is patient care, another one is polio prevention. For polio prevention this year, we needed $26.5 million over and above our usual needs. That's what uh, ran us from 50 to 75 million. Now, our patient, uh, patient aid program, that's where we give aid to those who need it financially, runs for approximately $29 million. Now, unless, uh, and uh, our, pro our professional education and scientific research program runs 19. If you'll add those up, you'll get 75. Now, we did not get 20 of that 75, and if we do not have it, we can't carry out those programs. Now, see what that would mean in patient aid. That would mean that we cannot give the uh, patient aid that we always have given for 16 years. You're giving patient it aid to people who have already incurred uh, who polio? Who have, that's right. And how long does that patient aid last? Well, it can last anyway from 30 days to an indefinite period of time, uh, three, four, five, six, or 10 years, really, uh, depending on the case. As a matter of fact, we spend, in the last five years, we spent half of our money on patient aid on, on old cases, what we call old cases, and the other half on current cases. Now, if we don't get this $20 million, we simply can't take care of those patients. And that would be a catastrophe because that would mean that patients that were cared for might eliminate some of those uh, crippling effects, uh, uh, which they may not eliminate if we can't care for them. Do you still so feel that so that, that we are on the verge of victory over this dread disease? I don't have any doubt about it. I, I, I think uh, uh, we're very hopeful that this uh, assault vaccine will prove to be effective. And that if it does, of course, that will be the answer to that. We'll still have a tremendous load of back cases that we'll have to take care of, and we'll have refinements to make in the vaccine. But unless the uh, immunology of polio is entirely different from every other disease, uh, we feel very encouraged about the success of this vaccine. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Nice Connor, for coming you. here tonight. Fine. The opinions expressed on the Longine Chronoscope were those of the speaker. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Ned Calmer. Our distinguished guest was Basil O'Connor, president of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. A Longine watch is one of the most perfectly functioning mechanisms made by man. On first acquaintance, one is astonished by its day-to-day -day performance and as months pass into years, its qualities of great accuracy and reliability become truly priceless. Now, these persuasive words are backed by fact. In competition with the finest watches of all the world, Longines watches have won highest honors. Ten World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals are some of these honors. For greater accuracy, Longines watches have won countless honors from great government observatories. Honors, too, in sports, aviation, and in science. In a watch, the best costs but little more than the least. And Longines watches do not carry a prohibitive price tag. For you may choose from many beautiful Longines models for both ladies and gentlemen for as little as $71.50. Now, if your present watch is not what it should be, or if you're planning to buy a watch as an important gift, these are facts to remember. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor watches.